Today we have Professor, Professor Jonathan Rutherworth of University College in London. Um, many of you know him. He's an Atlas member. He's uh, written a blog in The Guardian for years that I think many of you follow. He has a couple of books out that I highly recommend. Um, and he, he will talk about particle physics and the case for particle physics in the next decades and how we make that case to, the, to a general audience, to the public that wants to learn about these things and in the end may have to pay the bill of some of these projects. So, um, welcome to Valencia and the uh, stage is yours. Thank you very much. So, is that this working here? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation to do this. Um, this is an interesting talk to write, so I hope it's an interesting talk to listen to. Um, in that it's somewhere between, I, I know that I'm addressing scientists and, I think, and, and I'm talking about communication. And I actually think that um, communication at the moment is, is so important, um, and I, that I don't mean just communication with the general public, which is of course important, but also communication amongst ourselves as to what we might want to do next, um, and communication with our fellow scientists, and communication of course with the politicians, is so all pervasive <coughs> that this rather long-winded title could actually be just condensed into what's next for particle physics, because I think that the communication aspect is so fundamental to what we might do next, or as, as you'll, you'll, know, you'll either know or hear, we're at a stage where we're not actually maybe sure what we want to do next, and communication is such a key part of the decision-making process that um, it's fundamental to the whole of the future of particle physics and what we do next. So, I mean, particle, this is particle physics in one slide, of course. This is um, the standard model as we are. Um, we have the matter particles, the quarks, and the leptons, you know, the force carriers. And as discovered in 2012, we have underlying this the, the vacuum expectation value of of the, the bright angle of Higgs field and therefore and the manifestation of that in the Higgs boson that we discovered in 2012 and that won the Nobel Prize for the theorists, not the experimentalists, in um, 2013. Um, so that's, that's been a, quite an interesting journey in point of, I mean, obviously exciting and fascinating from the point of view of physics, but also from the point of view of communication and doing science in public. And I want, I've got, I want to kind of just look back and kind of You'll see the direction the talk goes in from this slide. It reflects what I think lessons we can learn from, from this, from the discovery and, communi and from communicating that discovery. So there were some really good things about this. This, by the way, this beer bottle here, you can't really see it on the hill, unfortunately, but it's got Peter Higgs's name on it um, because they did a special brew of, of, um, of London Pride beer. Because in one interview, they asked Peter Higgs on the, when he flew back from CERN after the discovery, they said, did you, did you drink a load of champagne or something in CERN? He said, no, I had to get back on the plane, but luckily the plane had nice beer because he likes real ale and the plane had London Pride, so he had a kind of London, London Pride on the plane back to Edinburgh from CERN. And the London Pride PR people thought this was great, so they did a special London Pride group. It's a nice example of the kind of cultural impact that physics actually had at that stage. Um, so, there was a lot going on. This was after we turned the LHC on. In fact, this is the, the um, one of the, the, the Today program on Radio 4, which is the main news agenda setting program. What did we do well in that whole process? We, I think one of the main achievements of that is that we managed to get over the idea of science as a process. So, the, this radio program, for instance, and other um, mainstream media, big news, uh, news um, programs, <coughs> do feature science stories, but very often the science story is paper out today in nature or science, eureka moment, breakthrough, it's going to cure cancer, it's going to do whatever it is, some huge thing, no build up to it, no follow up after it, just like here's the science today and then it go, and then you never hear again. One of the things we did very well with the Large Hadron Collider is, of course my, my experience is a bias towards the UK media, so not all of it may apply around Europe, but this, I think some of it does. Um, but what we did well in the UK at least, and I think in general concern, was um, communicate the build-up. There were lots of milestones as we were building the IHC, there was lots of discussion about what it was for, um, and, and there's been a continuing discussion after the next discovery, and, and we had a lot of discussion about 
the collaborative nature of this, uh, how, and it was very clear that, this, that there were many people involved in this. This was what was more lone genius doing the breakthrough. There was a whole bunch of team of people internationally working on it. One of the best things was deal, this idea of dealing with uncertainty. I mean, I never believed I would be on primetime rate TV trying to explain the difference between three sigma and five sigma, but it, it happened, it was brilliant. And, and that is really valuable, for instance, to our colleagues in climate science who are trying to explain what they mean by a prediction of temperature rise and how, what they mean by confidence levels and what the model behind that is. We, we have a politically fairly neutral opportunity to explain some of that methodology in public, which I, I think and hope is helpful. And probably the most important thing was we, we managed to communicate physics as exciting. I mean, it was just clear that people were genuinely excited. This was not a manufactured media hype. This was every student, every postdoc, every professor, every engineer that you pointed the a, a, a microphone at was, was excited. So that was great. More neutral things, CERN as a brand clearly is a thing. So it's a little badge down here, but you see CERN used as a shorthand for high-tech, wacky science these days in, in adverts and things. For adverts of cars was the last one I saw. Fine. It's, it's useful in some ways. It can be misleading in other ways, maybe. We also managed to communicate some of the wider benefits of particle physics. Um, things that work less well, this idea of science of trying to prove a theory is very dangerous. And it's a wrong view of what science is. The idea that the LHC was going to Prove Peter Higgs and, and um, Englert and Brown right, or, and, and, that, and that would be a success, and if, and if we didn't find the Higgs, that would be a failure. Now, we all know that that's just not true, right? The, the, important, the, the LHC was a success if it answered the question, is the Higgs mechanism correct? Is the Higgs, does the Higgs boson exist? That was the goal of the experiment, not to go and prove the theory right. So, and we were suffering from that. <coughs> so, of course, there are other predictions about supersymmetry and, and extra dimensions and things, which were genuine possibilities people were genuinely excited about, but the fact that they haven't shown up yet doesn't make the experiment a failure. It means we know more than we did before, which is the goal of the experiment. But we, we did fall into this business of, you know, if, if the Higgs hadn't been in there, we would have had a real hard time trying to explain that that wasn't a failure. That was actually quite exciting in many ways, but nevertheless, um, it would have been difficult because of the way the debate was couched. Um, obviously, science is expensive, at least our science is very expensive, and that comes across. I mean, that's, not, that's true, so it's, it would be pointless to lie about it, but it's, it's nevertheless something we have to deal with. And we did, connected to this really, we connected with the particle physics is all about the Higgs, and once the Higgs is found and it's finished, we can all stop. Um, and that it's all about colliders, even, which is also not true. So, I'm going to kind of step back from the, the communicating with the public idea now and really give. Give, try and give a view of what I think we should be communicating rather than how to communicate it, if you see what I mean. So, I think we need to step back and be aware that the standard model that we have describes a vast array of phenomena over vastly different energy scales, ranging from very low energies all through you know, the atomic energy scales with, with QED through nuclear physics and then possibly up to the Planck scale. And actually, with the Higgs, we, in principle, might, this might be, um, this might work all the way up there, which would, of course, be strange to have this big gap here. Now, that's not a very intuitive way of looking at it. Maybe it kind of works for physicists, and the orders of magnitude are impressive. But I, I kind of like to think of it as a, an exploration. This is a map from uh, one of my books, and I'm going to use it because I think it provides a good um, analogy, even for physicists, never mind for the general public of the landscape that we're, we're, we're trying to explain and, and, and we're trying to understand and trying to explore and it <coughs> catches to what I think particle physics is about in, in a more, um, in an easier to assimilate way than, than many other things. So we can start by looking at little details and little areas in here. So if we start with um, the atomic physics energy scales and the electron, which is kind of the point of entry into this map, and we look what's going on there, how well do we really understand that? Do we, do we, is this map, how, how, how fine detail does this map go? How, how much can you zoom in on Google Maps on this map? Well, in atom land, you can zoom in a long way. You can look at the way <coughs> electrons interact with an electromagnetic field of a photon. You have quantum loops going on in there, of course. Um, you can have a principle, all kinds of different particles um, exchanging these loops. And you can calculate the answer as well. You can measure this incredibly precisely to, I think this is, I counted it before, it's 12 decimal places with the uncertainty in the last two, so it's incredibly precise. 
You can also, that's the measurement, and you can also calculate it with comparable precision that it agrees with the theory at a level of 10 to the minus 13. So this bit of the map is pretty well surveyed from one point of view. However, you don't need to go very far to find bits of the map that are less well known. If you just move down a little bit here, um, kind of roughly speaking, complexity goes upwards and energy goes this way, but it's kind of rough. It's more of a, it's just the way of looking at it. But if you look down here at the muon and you do the same thing for the muon here, um, the muon is harder to measure because it decays and it's harder to produce. Um, nevertheless, you can still do it and you can measure it to not quite the same precision, but, but um, still pretty precise. And you can calculate it similarly and you find that there's a disagreement at the level of 3.6 sigma, which everybody who listens to the explanations will know is enough evidence to get interested, but not enough to, dis to call a discovery. So this is a, a point of interest on the map, and this is this, the, the, currently a, this, the G minus two experiment at Fermilab is now measuring, making this more precise. This is, an, this is a picture, I don't know why, why it's shown by the Chicago weather, I don't know, it's kind of foreboding. But this is, a, obviously, those of you particle physicists at least will know this is the high rise at Fermilab. Um, this is the magnet from Brookhaven Laboratory, which had gone all the way from Long Island, all the way down south of Florida, and all over the Mississippi on a boat and then across to the lakes, and is now installed in a building behind the high-rise here, and is um, being used to re-measure the uh, magnetic moment of the, the muon to greater precision um, than was possible in Brookhaven, because Fermilab has more muons. And we should know in a year or two whether this, um, this 3.6 sigma um, becomes agreement or um, gets more significant <coughs> disagreement, or, and it's basically a clue as to phenomena on this map that we maybe don't know about yet. So even the bits of the map that we think we, we know quite well, um, it's an important message that we, there are things to learn still within this. Looking at next door kind of thing, slightly higher energy scales at, at the hadronic physics. Um, this is, you know, you've got the kind of, I don't know, the proton and the neutron are up here somewhere, and then this is supposed to be the, the connected, all, all the various um, hadrons that are around. There's still physics to learn there as well. So the, the, we, we know that the strong interaction QCD is a, it's a strongly coupled theory. Um, that means, at least in certain regions of, of, it, of energy, it's, it's not amenable to perturbation theory. You don't have a coupling constant that allows you to systematically improve the, uh, the precision of your calculation. Um, it's also very interesting in that it spontaneously gener generates an energy scale of its own, and in fact the mass of the proton comes in almost entirely from QCD, it's nothing to do with the Higgs, because you have a vacuum expectation value of QQ bar pairs and you have a uh, um, mass generated that way. So there's, there's all kinds of fascinating phenomenology going on there, lots of emergent phenomena. And perhaps most obviously is, is this phenomenon of confinement. So if you do do calculations in lattice QCD in this case, this is the the potential as you separate two quarks and you see that the potential energy is growing linearly as you do that, which means at some point, rather than the things becoming free, <coughs> there's enough potential energy around that you, cre you create new QQ bar pairs from the vacuum and you end up not, never having a free quark because you, you, you just create more quarks for it to bound to. So we can, we can start to understand this in, in terms of the, the, the potential between them. This is a graphical representation of the free quark potential in a, in a barrier. Um, and this is just a mass spectrum of hadrons as predicted and, and measured, predicted by lattice QCD and measured. So there's a whole fit subfield there that is nothing to do with the Higgs, it's nothing to do with high energy colliders at some level, although you can do some of this at high energy colliders, as we'll see in a minute. Um, there is, is absolutely fascinating and fundamental physics that's important. And I was being asked before, you know, Breakthroughs. How do, how do you keep media attention when there are breakthroughs? This, the last time I was on the main news program in the UK, was the pentaquarks. Now, from a physics point of view, you might say, well, pentaquarks not a fundamental new thing. It's a, but it's a, it's a, it is a new thing, and it's an emergent phenomenon from QCD. LHCB um, at Morio showed a new results on them. It wasn't even the first pentaquark. I mean, it was, it was just a more precise measurement and, and extra. There were new ones in there, but it wasn't the first ever pentaquark seen. Nevertheless, there's interest in this, and, it, and that we should not set our own bar too high that we think people are not interested in, in things that are not kind of dark matter or extra dimensions. People are interested in, lear in what we're learning about the way the world behaves, and the pentaquark was um, opened the door to, to lots of people about um, what we're doing at the LHC and, and, and what we're learning about particles. This is 
these are the structures that, that give indications of this in the mass of the JSI rho uh, mass. And this is, uh, it might be a, a molecule like this. It, might, it, it may be kind of a baryon and a meson molecule, or it may be five quarks and found in some different state. We don't really know yet. But we do know it's there. We do know it has um, non standard <coughs> baryon. So it's, it's minimal quark content. It's four quarks and an ounce of quark. So this is this is news. This is by the standards of um, by the standards of communication in most fields. This is big news, and we shouldn't be shy about saying this kind of thing. And in fact, the response to this kind of news item was actually generally very positive. It's not doesn't set the world on fire like the Higgs discovery did. But that, you don't have to do that every time. You have to just keep people engaged with what you do. And, and when you make a breakthrough that you think is interesting, you should tell people about it. And if they're not interested, so be it. But if they are, then it's good. <coughs> Okay, so looking further then at the uh, into this map, and uh, we, we looked, that was the hadron hadronic energy scales below the confinement scale, before below um, when, when quarks are not free, below lambda QCD, which is the characteristic scale of QCD, and there's kind of a bridge into the, the region where the quarks are free, where you actually do start with that those degrees of freedom. Then we can start doing perturbation theory. Oops, what's that? That wasn't supposed to happen. Microsoft has just crashed, so that um, one has crashed. <laughs> Never done that before. <laughs> um, right. Okay. That's strange. Okay. Um, it doesn't do it again in the same place. A quick revision at the top. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just hope it doesn't get. No, I tested it and it didn't crash before, so I hope that was just a random thing. Right. Okay, good. So, because we know the strong interaction as you go up in energy scale, which you're doing here from, from the characteristic masses just above the proton mass up to the energies that are being probed with the large hadron collider, then the coupling constant drops. Um, this is asymptotic freedom, of course. And um, that means you can do conventional perturbation theory, you can use Feynman diagrams the way we're used to using them. And this is a, um, an example of a, a, a possible Feynman diagram in the mean plus C minus goes to photon, QQ bar, and a gluon radiation. And because the confinement processes are much lower energy than the energies involved in the, the matrix element here, then you actually see that they dictate the characteristics of the event. So this is one of the first. I think this is the first three jet event observed in equals C minus at the Petra Collider in Hamburg. And um, what's going on here, of course, is that you, you have the kinematics of this event are dictated by the high energy part, which is this diagram. So there's a quark jet, a gluon jet, and a quark, and a, an, an anti quark jet, a gluon jet, and a quark jet in here. This is probably the gluon jet because it's, it's slightly broader, um, more, more color radiation. Um, but you can predict the characteristics of these events rather precisely now with, with, um, with QCD. And of course, you're not really seeing the quark and the gluon here, you're seeing hadrons that are formed by the fact that the confinement potential. Nevertheless, if you recluster these and, and, and interpret the kinematics that way, you can probe the short distance physics, you can use the jets to probe the short distance physics that's going on here. And that was the, the first, um, that's basically the observation of the gluon, the first direct evidence that the gluon is real. Um, but we're still doing this. This is a jet, jet uh, really a multi TV um, jet in a proton proton collision, an atlas. And we're doing exactly this, the, the, the same physics with these um, jets to understand that. As you see an initiated <coughs> very high energy, high energy objects radiating quarks and, and then gluons. And this is a measurement from um, run 2 data, not, not the full sample by any means, but the, um, an early run 2 measurement of. Um, the, the invariant mass of a pair of jets in atlas in a proton 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 collision, and you see that we, this is the because the this is the most common kind of event this quark gluon scattering at the LHC. This is the most direct probe at the at the highest energies that we have. It's the highest energy direct probe we have. It's getting up close to 10 TeV now um, in terms of um, well close on a long step, <coughs> 5 TeV. In terms of um, the central mass energy that we're probing, um, so this is this is a really key aspect of um, of exploration at the high energy scales, and also this whole business of understanding the structure of matter, the the behaviour of quarks and gluons at high energies, 
And you can also take that knowledge of asymptotic freedom inside the proton. And if you, if you probe the proton at high enough energy scales, then you also see quarks and gluons as though they were free inside the proton. And this is the, the plot from the HERA electron proton collider, uh, again in Hamburg, um, which was running up until 2007. And what you're seeing here is as you look closer and closer inside the proton at higher and higher energy scales, and then up here, it's different momentum. This, this is the cross section, but each one of these lines is a different um, momentum fraction of the proton x, the opening that you're probing. You see that we can describe the evolution of this extremely accurately and effectively with perturbative QCD, given some non perturbative input that you evolve using perturbative QCD from then on, which is kind of important um, because you. Uh, you want to, um, if we're colliding protons, you'd like to understand what the proton is made of at some level in the standard model, and that's what this is telling you. Um, but this is also a nice point at which to start then investigating, going up from, from this lambda QCD type and above scales up to a more interesting or more frontier area of the map, uh, which is up here. Um, and you see this either closed zone here, which clearly is where the W and the Z and things live. Um, what I mean by that is, this is now more data from the electron-proton collider um, here. Um, and what you're looking at here now is the um, neutral current cross-section. So what we're doing is colliding electrons off the proton. And normally, there's a photon, a virtual photon exchange. It's electromagnetic interaction um, with some admixture of the Z boson in there as well. You see that that's mostly what happens. And you mostly it's neutral current scattering. Mostly <coughs> electron scatters off. But of course, you can also exchange W boson in here, in which case this lepton will turn into a neutrino. And the detectors can also measure that, although we don't see the neutrino, we can measure the missing energy. And you see that the, the, this weak um, interaction is much less probable. That's why the weak force is uh, it's called the weak force. But as you go up in energy, something interesting happens, and these converge. And of course, this is to do with the mass of the W and the Z boson. This is the electroweak symmetry breaking <coughs> scale. This is essentially the, the kind of no-go zone before the, the large hadron collider um, in, in our map. And we, this is above, above this energy scale or around it is where the Higgs was supposed to exist and has to, in order to explain this unification, because this is driven by the mass of the W and the Z, and it's the mass of the W and the Z that comes from the Higgs. So what goes on at this energy scale? Well, we, we, we all had the generation of colliders and studied it fairly carefully with the Z boson this up here. This is where the W and the Z originate. Um, the lead collider, for instance, provided an absolutely precise measurement of the, the width of the Z, which is one of the things that gives some fundamental input to this diagram, because it tells you there can only be um, three generations of neutrinos. So this, this pattern of three generations is not copied forever. There may be more generations at this stage, but but they don't have, if there are, they don't have neutrinos like the rest, so they're not really copies, they're, they're different in a fundamental way. So that's, this is clearly an interesting energy scale in nature, it's something you can shoot at experimentally without really much theoretical bias, okay? I mean, these, on this plot, the, the, data, the theory is doing very well, the lines of the theory, but the data is telling you this on its own, it's telling you that there are two very different phenomena in nature that are actually converging at this energy scale. There's something important happening at that energy scale. So you can build a large hadron collider on the basis of that plot, basically. So we want to go there and study what's going on. Of course, it helps a lot if you have a theoretical idea behind it that you're going to test, but it's already telling you this is a special energy scale in nature. And the Z is there as well. <coughs> so the Higgs is supposed to be out here on the fuzzy edge of this island. Um, this is a plot from March 2012, which of course, a significant date for those of you who remember July 2012. Um, this is now the input from the Tevatron, all the direct searches below that, and the indirect fits to the, using the measurements of the mass of the top and the, and the W mass particularly. Um, telling you, if there is a standard model Higgs, where is it in terms of its mass? And it has to be at this stage within one of these gray bands um, from the direct searches, so Atlas and CMS and the Tet have ruled out a lot of this space already. The Tevatron and Atlas and CMS and left have ruled out much of the lower masses. Um, and the, the ellipses on here are the ellipses from the electroweak fits, so indirect quantum corrections constraining with the consistency check of the standard model. So really we're, we're getting quite tense um, because this is the only replace the Higgs can be um, to make the, uh, the theory end up being um, consistent. And of course it was. 
I'm sorry, no, no spoilers, this isn't Game of Thrones, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I'm going to show this anyway, um, even though I'm sure most of you have seen it before. This is the, one of the discovery plots that was shown at, at, at the Nobel Prize ceremony a year later, because the date of taking goes past the, the day we announced the discovery up to the end of um, 2012. But what you're seeing here is the four lengths on invariant mass spectrum, and the reason I'll spend a little bit of time on it <coughs> is because these plots are one of the most powerful communication tools I've ever used. In, in particle physics. There's so much science going on. And I've shown this to, to five-year-old kids and to politicians and, and cynical civil servants, and it, it just works. Because you can explain, if they're up for it, you can explain the underlying physics, you can explain the idea that you hypothesize there are intermediate particles that have a mass, and you can talk about the Z, and you can say that when they're real, it comes up here. That's if you can. I wouldn't do that with six-year-olds, but you can do that with people if you want. But even more fundamental than that, you can talk about the error bars. You can say, what does it mean? Well, you're, why does more data help you? You've done the experiment. Why do you want more data? Well, because if we get more data, we shrink these error bars. These are statistical error bars. Look at the noise. Look at the noise in the system. Look how the noise reduces as we collect more data. Think about the quantum mechanics. Why doesn't the same thing happen every time we collide a pair of protons? It doesn't, right? It's quantum mechanics. It's quite unusual. It's, it's like rolling a dice. You know, if you want to find out whether a dice is fair, you don't just roll it six times and expect one, a one, a two, a three, four, five, and a six. You roll it six million times maybe if you've got the time, and then you see if you get roughly a million, and then you know maybe it's fair. There's so much you, about the whole Higgs discovery and about science in general that you can extract from <coughs> this kind of plot. Anyway, but what we extract from it is there's a Higgs, so that's great. <laughs> so now we know what's going on on the eastern edges, the high energy edges of our map. Go in, there's this kind of bridge of mountains, which is the electrically symmetry breaking scale. The LHC gets us across it, and we find the Higgs there. It's all great. And we then go on and do precision Higgs measurements, so we see that the Higgs is coupling to the, um, to the standard model particles in the way it should. If it's to explain their mass, we measure this. What this is is a, the latest measurements of the Higgs mass, but in multiple different channels. So they should be consistent if it's the same particle decaying. See that they are we're building up multiple um, cross checks and triangulations, basically surveying this land more and more carefully. And again, I think with the, the rolling the dice and shrinking the error bars as we get more and more data, this is what the high, lumin high luminosity LHC is about initially and what future colliders um, may well want to do. Surveying this land really carefully and think back, you know, we we've, we've discovered a muon a long time ago, but there are still mysteries to do with muon G 2 that we're trying to understand. We barely begun exploring this land here. And then, when you, if you look to the Higgs, what do you want to do next? Do you want to carry on sending east? Is this archipelago of the whole story? Um, well, first of all, <coughs> is our vessel here, is it fit for, no, our vessel is the Large Hadron Collider at the moment, is our vessel fit for purpose? <coughs> and we, we, in principle, now we have a, a theory in the standard model that can make predictions for what's going on in the eastern oceans here. It's, it's valid. If the Higgs hadn't been there, then we wouldn't have that theory anymore. We'd be back to the drawing board. We'd be trying to work out some new way of predicting what's there. Now we have the Higgs. Um, in principle, we can carry on using perturbative calculations in the standard model up to multi TV scales. So this kind of stuff is going on in our collisions at very high energies. And I, you know, one of the things that, that concerns me and that, that I've been working on is how we actually turn these things into actual predictions. Um, and there's a lot going on. It's worth just stepping back and saying that the standard model is quite a, a subtle and complicated theory. The fact that you've discovered all the particle content of it doesn't mean you know all the physics of the standard model. There's emergent physics there that is both interesting in itself and important for predicting, check, checking whether the standard model is actually correct or whether there's other new physics going on in there. So in a diagram like this, you know, every vertex here in principle, has has a coupling constant attached to it, which we saw is the, the thing that asymptotically um, gets smaller, so you can use perturbation theory that way. But there can be quite a lot of them, and there can be loops, and there can be there are many different possible ways of drawing, connecting the initial state here with the final state here, and all of them have to be taken into account. Um, then you also have kinematic enhancements where these guys are almost collinear or, or very low energy, where alpha, the low energy than alpha s is getting big, so you have to do something clever there. If they're close together, you have logarithmic enhancements in the kinematics that mean you have to do resummation things. And you also have problems that, so, so 
that these can be resold, which means you're exponentiating essentially and do an analytical summation. But then there are overlaps between the two, so you still you need to find ways of using both approximations together. And there's a huge amount of just understanding the practicalities of doing basic predictions with, with field theory and, in, in these regions, and then also in measuring the, the experimental challenges of measuring this kind of event. And this is ongoing. I mean, this is a measurement here of one of these diagrams with the production of a W, um, actually in this case it's a Z boson up here, um, produced here, it's a, a vector boson with lots of jets. And this is the, this, what you're seeing here is, is a function of the transverse momentum of the highest energy, the highest momentum jets in the event, the cross section with some rescaling applied to the other curves. But what's the, the impressive thing here really is, well first of all the theory is doing a very good job of describing this, and the measurements go out to pretty high energies, but this is um, events with at least one jet, at least two jet, at least three jet, at least four jet. Excuse me. And in fact, we have measurements of even higher multiplicities. So we're really probing the standard model and completely the idea that you see, um, you know, five jets with about 400 GeV each of energy, along with the vector boson in the same event, and you can actually understand this within the context of the standard model is not trivial and not to be taken for granted. And is absolutely essential if we want to really survey the Eastern Ocean effectively with that map. And this is a, this is one Frank Krauss's uh, famous diagram of what's going, the kind of complexity that's going on here. But yet we claim we can understand this. You have a hard process. You have possible multiple hard processes. You have the QCD radiation in there. You have the hybridization stages, and then all the particles decay. And we can calculate this, simulate it, and produce effective um, predictions for what's going on. So as well as being interesting in its own sake, what this means is that we, you know, we can go into this unknown ocean with well-defined precise measurements and calculations of these high multiplicities. This is an example of the Higgs again in the gamma gamma EK <coughs> channel. Um, so this is after you, you look for the bump, you subtract the background, and you look then at not just discovering the Higgs and showing the bump, but measuring the transverse momentum of the Higgs. And this starts giving you sensitivity to how the Higgs is being produced, whether there are beyond the standard model effects in there, whether there are new particles that the Higgs. I mean, one question is, um, as I was saying, we know that the, the, that matter or something like it is out there somewhere. If all the fundamental particles get their mass from the Higgs, and if there are new fundamental particles out there, such as that matter, maybe they also get their mass from the Higgs. Maybe the Higgs is a kind of portal, a kind of connection through to these. So measuring the way it behaves in these high energy collisions is possibly giving us clues about that. This measuring the transverse momentum here and, um, and being able to describe it in the theory is absolutely critical. And of course, if the Higgs has got high transverse momentum, high transverse momentum then it has jets on the other side of it balancing that or something. So understanding these high multiplicity events is really important. And then this high boost even for electroweak scale objects. So as well as just high multiplicity, <coughs> Producer Higgs in this case with a boost, the Lorentz boost of 300 GeV, um, corresponding to 300 GeV, and more the same applies. It's the first time really that we've been able to see this. It's a new feature. Um, the, the, we have conservative QCD in operation from the point at which we produce the particle all the way up to when it starts breaking down for the soft stuff for hybridization. But the electroweak symmetry breaking scale, that key scale in, on, on the, the electron proton plot, that's in the middle somewhere now, so it's, it can be inside the jet. It can be, it can be um, within this the whole process of showering, you can actually have Higgs production or top production or something. There. So you have very boosted particles, so you need to start interrogating that. So the, that's what I just said, the, the electric symmetry breaking is between these scales, and you can end up with electric particles inside them. And we need new experimental techniques and new theoretical calculations to do that. I mention this partly because this is the last time I was in Valencia, you had the boost meeting here in 2012. Um, we were in this square last night. So, <laughs> this, is, this is from 2012 when the mass cell looked exactly the same as it looks now. <laughs> 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 uh, which was an excellent meeting and was one of the reasons I was really keen to come back to Valencia this time. Um, but this is actually a, this is a series of meetings. We had one in London in 2014 as well and they alternate between the US and Europe in general. Um, and it's because this is a new um, experimental technique, this idea of, it's never been seen before uh, the, uh, before the LHC turned on, because the LHC is the first place with enough energy that you actually have electroweak physics inside there, so therefore you need to deal with this in physics. And the, this, the meeting this year is impossible. Right? So, um, 
So uh, this is an example of that in process. So this is the, the cross section of top quark production as a function of the transverse momentum <coughs> of the top. Um, when I say of the top, though, this is a top properly defined. So it's a top not defined as a propagator in a diagram, but defined as a real final state object with the lepton missing energy and the BJ, which is the experimental physical signature of the top. Um, and then that is all, all within inside one jet. In fact, in this case, there's, there's no lepton. This is entirely a hydronic um, top, so the top decays to a W, and then that decays hydronically. And you use um, jet substructure to, to identify those tops, and then you compare these fully simulated, full event um, calculations that you can do in Monte Carlo's to it, and this is incredibly sensitive to new physics. There are many, many new physics models that give you strange features in here, which at the moment we're not seeing in the debate. So this is all part of us sailing eastward on this map. Um, but I want to just step back again because um, so in, into the map um, for a moment. I'll come back to what we might do further on the east here soon. But th this message that we need to get across is that just because we've drawn the map doesn't mean we understand everything on the map completely, is there are two particular areas where that is absolutely the case. If you, look, you might notice on this map, it's a kind of a tortured analogy in the book. But if you look, the, the, the bottom quark here has got a little airport that's not actually in the same place as the tank. And, and likewise, the down quark here and the straight quark here. Um, in the book, this is an, an analogy that you, you only fly into these things on cheap airlines, and the, 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 um, the airport isn't actually near the tank that you want. Because this is an analogy it's for the fact that the, the mass eigenstate of the quark is not that the same as the weak eigenstate of the quark, and we have a mixing between the two. It gets even worse for the neutrinos. But, um, and so if you look more closely at this, and what's going on there, this is, this is the place where, if you understand that mixing, this is the only place to understand the model where you can um, introduce some difference between matter and antimatter, or basically CP violation can enter into it, and this is a key ingredient for understanding a big chunk of the phenomenology of the universe, not least why it's mostly made of matter and not antimatter. Um, so you can parameterize that, the mixing, or the, basically the relationship between the airports and the towns on the map, in terms of the unitarity triangles, of, of how, how these particles decay and how they respond differently, and what the mixing angles actually are, and what the magnitude of the triangle is. And before you know, the, the, the B factors for Bauer and Bell switched on, we didn't even know whether this was actually a closed triangle. The standard model doesn't actually predict the values of the angles, but it does predict that this must, must be a triangle. Um, that's where we are today. We know that the, the standard model does violate CP symmetry um, by this kind of diagram that will do it. Um, but and we, we, we know it violates it, and we know that this is a triangle to some pretty good precision. The Bell 2. Um, B factory has just started uh, it, running again now at KK. LHCB is still making measurements of these angles and, and the sides of the triangle. We heard in the Granada meeting last week um, that this is, you know, this is expected to, the precision look at, if you look at how the, the error bars, these bands of the uncertainties, if you look at it shrink, they shrink much more. Now it may be that this triangle then turns out not to be a triangle. It may be that not all of these things coincide and then there are new sources of CP violation in the standard model. We don't know. This is what we expect in about five to ten years, I guess. Um, probably more like five than ten. Um, if the standard model is right, then all these things will converge on one point. If not, then if they don't, then we know there are other sources of CP violation in the standard model. There, there are, at the moment, there are some signs of this may, that, that this kind of studies may not um, Play out. This is actually not, not to do with the unitarity triangle, particularly, but to looking at rare decays of B quarks um, that are produced uh, uh, in the B factories under LHCB. And again, this is from Morion, just in, in March this year. Um, you see that the standard model prediction here for what the branching ratio, in this case, this is the branching ratio um, for D stars. Where's my definition? Yeah, so the D star decays to tau and to other leptons, but for the D meson, which contains charm, and the D star meson, um, likewise. Um, and the ratio should be essentially here, if the standard model is correct. The measurements seem to indicate that that may not be the case. It's still a reasonable sentence, it's not five sigma, but it's enough to be interested. Similarly, the, the ratio of muons, muons to electrons should be one, if lepton universality works and the standard model is correct. Um, but it, there are signs maybe that it's not. 
And there's an interplay then between that and what we can do um, with the direct search, is at the, the um, Large Hadron Collider. Just to give you an example, we, we can, theorists can introduce a new particle or interaction to explain this, so you make up some new Z boson um, that couples the generations in some way that, that you can fit to explain the anomalies, and this is an industry for theorists still doing this. Um, and then you can compare it to what we see. Oops, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, I think a, a load of slides, of, a load of pictures have vanished from that slide. Never mind. Um, so essentially, you can, what I was going to say there, the, these papers here, we're going to show you that you can use the current collider data because this end time will show up in, in the kind of distributions, the, the boson plus jet distributions and things will show up there. So the two talk back to each other, and there's a chance that these kind of flavor measurements can give us pointers to what we might see and what we should see. Um, in the more direct measurements as we probe the, the final states. So there's a, a nice kind of loop between these things which we hope will converge. And I already mentioned the neutrinos. Um, their, their airports are even further, further away from the towns. In fact, we don't even know where the towns are in some, in some cases. Um, the neutrinos have a mixing matrix, they have masses, um, which is the only really substantial modification that's had to be made to the standard model since it was uh, invented. Um, and the standard model as originally proposed, the neutrinos were massless. We know that's not true. Um, we know that, um, so this is the measurement from snow, where they, the submarine neutrino observatory, where they measure snow, solar neutrinos, and they can measure the flux of all three different flavors of neutrinos, or they can measure the sum of all three, and they can measure the electron ones individually. And they show that indeed the, the, um, the electron flux is less than one, but the, the uh, the, the, so less than three in, this, in these units. Um, that they all give a consistent neutrino flux from the sun, but actually on the way from the sun to us, some of the electron neutrinos have turned into new on the time neutrinos. You can then, that establishes, along with the super K results from um, um, atmospheric neutrinos, that establishes that the neutrinos have mass when the mixing happens. And then you go away and you build accelerator experiments and look at uh, reactor experiments and measure the, um, the parameters of that mass mixing. So again, this is another bit of the map that although it's within our purview and that we have actually explored it at some level, there's still much more physics to be done there and much more to be understood. And in particular, this provides a, an extra sort of possible source of CP violation and therefore maybe an extra ingredient to the cosmology of how matter and antimatter develop differently in the universe. But overall, we, we've got quite a neat map there. It's kind of nice and self-contained. We've got some areas to go and focus and explain on. Um, and it's important to remember that before we get too pleased with ourselves, this is beyond the standard model. This is, of course, the picture of a black hole in the middle of the galaxy. The reason I say it's beyond the standard model is not because it's a really cool picture that um, shows a black hole in the middle of the galaxy, but actually because it's gravity. This is beyond the standard model. We don't, I mean, not only is the picture of the black hole beyond the standard model, but the apple falling on Newton's head is beyond the standard model. Um, so, of course, we have we have a theory, a gauge, gauge quantum field theory, um, based on, um, on on gauge symmetries, which with the Higgs in addition, which explains a vast array of phenomenology, but not this bit of phenomenology. We don't include gravity in it. It's super weak um, by our standards. So, from the point of view of the IHC, that's fine. We can ignore it, um, but that's not really acceptable in real life. Um, now you, you can take the point of view that we have general relativity, that's an extremely um, accurate, beautiful theory that explains gravity extremely well. Um, you would know, it's not a quantum theory, so you might worry that somewhere near that black hole they will become incompatible with each other, and that's true. Um, but you could take the kind of, for all practical purposes, who cares? As a physicist, you would care, but never mind. Um, but even if you do that, it's not good enough because we know this is uh, the dynamics of galaxy rotation in the curves are just beyond the standard model, even if they're beyond the combination of standard model and general relativity. Because we know that if you uh, they're rotating too fast, so if, if either there has to be more, more, or there has to be more gravitational force holding them together than we'd expect. So either you have to change general relativity, which no one's really managed to do successfully yet, although people still try, or you have to add more mass, which of course is dark matter which is therefore not, as far as we know, a standard model particle. There are some standard model candidates, but in general, 
they're quite hard to make work, so it may well, but then this is not a small correction, of course, this is a factor of five in the mass of the, of the universe, in this thing, um, which is sort of embarrassing for a particle physicist, and back to the communication bit for a while, it's actually quite good to, to be embarrassed in public that we don't understand the whole of the universe like this. Um, one of the worst impressions we can give, as I said at the beginning, is that discovering the Higgs tick the last box and the standard model, and now physics is finished. And these, of course, are very good ways of making sure that that's not true. But the, 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 well, we know that's not true, but communicating the fact that that's not true, um, along with some of the other more detailed um, explorations of the, the map itself. But what we're really doing here then is, is, is wondering about what, what, what might there be off the map? I mean, in a way, for the first time in my career as a particle physicist, we are, you, know, you can take the view that experiment is for the first time ahead of theory. Okay? I mean, we've been, it's not quite true because I think the neutrinos it was ahead as well for a while, and Ray Davis was miles ahead of the theory on neutrinos so with, with the, the um, solar neutrino anomaly. But in terms of the standard model, you know, we completed the standard model, but we know that the standard model can't be the whole story. And now if we take the fact that actually Electroweak scale supersymmetry did not suddenly leave out because of the LHC. If it's there, it's hiding more subtly than we thought. Then there isn't a ready made theory map for us to follow anymore. We're really off the map in the sense that we've never been before. And this is a really important thing to communicate. It is actually really exciting from my point of view as an experimentalist. I, I know many theorists who have got over their disappointment that their higher order SUSY calculations are not immediately relevant and are actually having a lot of fun exploring. Um, alternatives that maybe suffered from planning light on the SUSY. Now, as far as I know, there's no more, there's no equivalently beautiful consensus driven theory um, to supersymmetry, and supersymmetry is still very much alive, but the space, the reading space for alternatives is opening up, and maybe something will come from there. So that's really where we are. We're sitting on the, I like to think of sitting on it in a bar site, in a pub on the, on the dockside um, on the eastern coast of Bozonia. Chatting with the theorists about uh, what might be going on out here is dark energy, extra dimensions, quantum gravity, and that kind of supersymmetry, maybe. Um, with our little experiments and the little ships, of course, that can actually go and look and try to work out which of these stories to believe, or maybe believe none of them and just go and look. And which brings us to new, the new ships, the, the tools we have to explore this thing, which is the colliders. And this was what we were discussing um, last week in, in Granada. So, there are a couple of big motivations for what to do next, whether we have in hands, and I'm focusing on colliders rather than, I've already discussed the fact that it's not just about colliders, we have the neutrino side of things, we have the flavor physics side of things, we have the G minus two anomaly. But if you're focusing now on the eastern side, the way to directly access that is to build a bigger boat and, and, and go and look. So that's a collider. So the Higgs is, is a completely new object. It's not just another quark or just another lepton. It's unique in the standard model. As I said, it may be a portal to some kind of dark sector that explains that matter. It may, whatever else is out there in terms of particle content of the universe, it may um, give us some good clues there. Um, so one of the proposals on the table, which actually multiple proposals, but one motivation is to go study the Higgs more carefully. If you have an E plus C minus machine at 250 GeV or so, you can, um, not resonantly, but very efficiently reproduce Higgs plus Z boson events and measure that very carefully. So you can detect those, even if the Higgs decays to something completely invisible, you can still measure the decay products of the Z, and therefore you can measure the total width of the Higgs, you can measure um, and figure out the properties of it, which you can't do with a Hadron machine, because you don't fully contain the event in the same way. So there are various options for that. There's, um, a proposal um, on the table in Japan, which they're still discussing, to build a linear collider. There's a, a proposal for linear colliders at, at um, CERN, um, CLIC, to do this as stage one. There are also circular options, so if CERN builds a huge tunnel, um, or the Chinese build a huge tunnel, then you can actually do an electron positron machine in, in a circular machine, which has some advantages, but of course, in the end, the circular machine will run out of energy because you'll, it will have a limitation on the energy because of. Um, Synchrotron radiation, where it's a linear colliders, you can in principle just build them longer. Um, there's another, the other motivation is really to, that's that's kind of zooming in on both on this area of Bosonia that we've barely, we've only just got access to. But of course, if you want to actually explore the ocean to the east and explore the energy frontier, then the circular machines will, will can do that if you put hadrons in there or maybe even electrons and hadrons. Um, you could also maybe think about 
Um, a vehicle either, if you can think of it, we not build one at the moment, but you could think about doing the, the R&D and seeing if we can build one. Uh, <coughs> these, these require huge tunnels, this could be a smaller tunnel for a similar energy reach, could even be in the, uh, in the existing LHC tunnel. Um, and if you know, if you find something that you want to go and look at a particular energy, then you can also extend, as I say, these, these linear colliders up to that energy and go and shoot for that. Um, and so here's the, the, um, the map of how what these things might look at at CERN. I'm sorry it's not come out so well on this projector, but um, I can even work out where it is. This is Lake Geneva here. So this is the Swiss going forward with this yellow thing that stands out. What more noticeable on the map than it is in real life. Um, and uh, this, is, this is the Large Admiral Collider here, where we will be doing the high luminosity studies for the next few years. But then there's a proposed site for the click. Uh, this will be the energy frontier click, the one that goes up to multi TV, or this 100 kilometer tunnel which goes under the lake and behind the Soleil and back again to Sir. So these things, these are the kind of things we have to discuss. You would, in a way, you'd think, well, why, why, why can't we just do the high luminosity LHC and then discuss these later? Of course, the problem is the time scales involved. To even do the legal work to dig either of these tunnels will probably take seven or eight years. So even before you've even made a hole in the ground. So the, the, you have to start discussing them, and this is what we were doing in Granada last week, um, which was a very, it was amazing, a very interesting meeting, amazingly hard work, kind of half past eight in the morning until seven o'clock at night, informal meetings, and then dinner, arguing about physics all evening as well. I think it's fair to say that there was progress made, and there are some ideas um, coming forward that there's maybe a consensus building around, but it's certainly not over yet. This process will hopefully converge in a strategy for European, a European strategy for particle physics, which of course actually has to take account of the global picture as well, not just the European picture, um, which will hopefully emerge um, in the spring next year, basically. There's a drafting session in, in January, and, and this may go in some direction as to at least a plan A or a plan, and a plan B for what we might do next, what kind of vessels we need in order to explore that eastern ocean. So that's where we are. We're on the, we're, we're on the cusp of exploring this. In fact, the, the high lumia LHC will get us some way into this ocean. It may show up something. It may show up one of these monsters if we're, if we're really lucky. Not all these colliders will work. Some of them will sail on and go ahead. So this is one that's not worked so well here, I think. Um, we'll, we'll see. Hopefully, anything we build will work. But we want, not all of them will actually get off the ground. Not all of them will actually get built. Nevertheless, um, we have to bear in mind, though, that although we know that this is not all the physics there is, we don't know where any new physics is. Right? So it might be that there's nothing but ocean out there. And we have to face that fact. With the Higgs, we had the special energy scale that we had to go and look at, and we, could, we knew either the standard model would fail there, or we would find the Higgs boson. We are not in a similar position. Okay? It could be that the new physics is out of reach of any of the ships that we know how to build. It could be that it's just over the horizon. The important thing is that if we don't go and look, we'll never know. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I, I, should, I meant to say, the maps are all Nick from this book of mine. I'm not really advertising the book. I want to thank Chris Wormel, who's the illustrator. I didn't draw it myself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, John. We have time for a few questions. I have a question about the process of uh, uh, understanding what is new. Uh, in particle physics, we are used in the last 30 years, maybe, to wait for a signal that we precisely know what should be. And then when finally you got it into in 2012, you already recognize that this could be the Higgs, and then you try to check the spin and so on and so forth. But I mean, you have already basically know you are new in the, the that was the things. Now, we are in a new region in which we have no, absolutely no idea of what you should expect. Uh, however, the, the level of uh, sophistication of the experiments make uh, new signals maybe uh, extremely difficult to understand, to, to, I don't know, to, to point to a precise direction uh, of something. And I can make to, to, to situation in which we already have something like that, that is uh, dark matter, 
and you have the physics. In dark matter it searches, you have the Laman Bra signal in which the there is one experiment that is, uh, since 10, uh, 15 years uh, claimed to have a signal and many experiments trying to look for the same that doesn't get any. And in neutrino physics we have an SND that got a signal 20 years ago and in Boom we should check got another signal in a different region and other experiments looking for the same that are getting nothing. So, new signals in which you have no idea what you are looking for, maybe could be very difficult to, to understand. And you could get situation in which a new circular uh, big uh, accelerator could make uh, a anomaly discovery in some particular region and you have no way to repeat the experiment because if this is the only large uh, accelerator that you can build. So, how do you think you can try to explain to the public that uh, we are in a situation in which repeatability maybe is not so easy to do and uh, we could got signals that are not very easy to certify? That's good. It's a good question. Um, I, I think the, the business of repeating experiments, so with the, with the neutrino sector example you gave, this, in both those examples you gave, the experiments have been repeated and actually not confirmed by independent ones. So the LSMD one, I guess, is still open and there are still people looking at that. There are you build ways of trying to explain all the measurements at the same time. But certainly, I think with the Dama Libra one, there, there's a lot more focus on, on the other explanations, which are not to do with new neutrino, with, with that matter, um, in that case. Um, the, so, a bet, maybe another better example from neutrinos is actually Ray da the Ray Davis experiment, where you measure the solar neutrino flux from back when, whenever it was, I mean, a series of experiments from the 60s and 70s, which is just wrong. It's just one number. It's a really hard experiment. I remember being, doing graduate courses, and people were saying, oh, some people would go, this is, up, this, this is a nonsense experiment. Has, they have to make a mistake. Other people say, this is clearly neutrino oscillations. And we didn't know, and there were multiple experiments built, and in the end there was a killer experiment which was snow, uh, and, and also actually can and candy coincidentally with the, at the same time with the, the um, atmospheric neutrinos, but snow really gave the definitive answer by being able to measure the flux regardless of flame. So that's a good example of what I think would happen. I mean, I, you don't, with a high energy collider, you're not measuring just one number for a start, you're measuring a whole series of features of the event. Now, if the number is, is a flavor anomaly, a more indirect thing, then maybe that becomes something that you try and tackle via other, you can do it with lower energy, high luminosity machines or something. If the number is, if it's a bump, then like, you know, so, like the Higgs, for instance, but you don't know what it is, or if it's some deviation from the standard model predictions, you do repeat that experiment over and over again, right? I mean, we're repeating it every time we collide a pair of protons. You have an independent data set. If you remember the 750 GeV, Bump that went away, that experiment was repeated because we could throw that data away, do it again, and it didn't show up again. So you are repeating the experiment at some level. Plus, of course, you have two general purpose detectors. And Marcel won't like me saying it, but I do worry if we have a linear collider with only one experiment on the linear collider, that makes the situation even worse. And because they would worry that there's some problem with the detector, which at least without the CMS, we have independent measurements of the same thing. So it's a, it's not, as you can tell from the number of words, there's no simple answer, but I think um, this idea of repeating experiments is an important, and independent confirmation is an important idea to get across to the public. I think in that case it was important that Atlas and CMS both independently confirmed the Higgs, for instance. Whether you then have a ready-made theoretical framework in which to drop that new result is over to the theorists at that point, and at some level you kind of take a Bayesian approach, you have a huge bias toward the standard model being right, just because it always has been. And that includes the Higgs uh, discovery as well. So you will, you will demand further proof of some anomaly, and you will try and, uh, try and find other ways and this suggest models that will connect that observation to others and follow that process. But if there was something so striking that, that well over five sigma both experiments saw it by the high energy machine, then um, you would find that the ways, would, uh, the motivation to, to build a theory that accommodates it and then look for other consequences of that theory that you can test in other ways would be really powerful. Right, and I think you've learned at that point that 
that new physics that you're looking for is at a scale that is accessible to the provider. That is key information at that point. And you can sort of put it in the so uh, about this comment you made about uh, we need to acknowledge the possibility that maybe the standard model is isolated and there's nothing near the standard model in, in the East Ocean. Uh, my question is, uh, there is there's clearly a tension between you, you want to say exciting things like we are going to discover dark matter or discover the origin of new genome matter. But we don't know if we're going to do that. So how, how can we communicate this to the public without uh, introducing false, uh, false expectative, no? without, uh, without disappointing them if it yeah. doesn't show us? No? Um, that, that is the, the multi-billion dollar question. <laughs> um, the, the, the my answer to it, which I mean, it's difficult and it needs work, um, but my answer to it is I, People are excited by the idea of research, many people, but, but just by the idea of research. It's the, and, and my daughter was asked to research some stuff this when she was 12. And her idea of research, was to, and, and the teacher's idea of research, was to go and look in books and see what you can find. You say, but we're trying to find things that are not in any book, because it's something no one ever knew before. I remember when I was about my daughter's age, actually understanding that, and I wanted to write a book about space and the planets. And I, got, I was doing it with my friend, so it was geeky. But, <laughs> the, um, but we, uh, we, got, we gave up because we realized that we were, people were finding out new things faster than we could write down the things we already knew. And, and that's a really wonderful concept. And I, I think you have to try and explain that. But this, we are looking somewhere no one ever has looked before. And it's not just a random place. It's, it's uh, smaller distances into the heart of matter and at higher energies than we've ever looked before. Of course we don't know what we're going to see, you know? But the excitement is that we don't know dark matter may be there, or it may be a desert. We just don't know, but we'll never know unless we look, and the excitement is in the looking. And okay, I'm an experimentalist, so maybe I'm giving a... But that is really what excites me. This is not fake... Um, this is always my, was always my attitude, even in the build to the Higgs discovery. Was, I just want to know the answer. I don't... To, you know, I care what the answer is, but it won't be dis I won't be disappointed one way or the other. Now, it's not quite that simple because, of course, I really want to know what that matter is, and if my new machine doesn't tell me, I will be disappointed. But, but I will still, at least I'll know. I'll, I'll know more about the, the, the nature of the universe than I did, even if what I know is actually a null result, that actually the answer isn't in the region I looked. It's a significant extension of the region we can see. It's a significant extension of the validity of our own current ideas of physics, and we have to be honest that those that you know, that will be slightly disappointing if we still have dark matter as a not understood thing at the end of this program. On the other hand, we'll have ruled out such a sway of possible explanations. We will really have advanced human knowledge in a way that, that is not in any books now. That no one did. And I think it's that it's at the end. The key is the nature of research, which applies not just to particle physics but to all science at some level. But you're finding out something that you may be the first person ever to know. You're not going to read a book about it. But this place never knows that. That can find people's imaginations. This question is similar to this one because you already said that particular physics is expensive. And this is probably the idea that society is getting from, from particular physics. So the question is beyond the excitement that we have about the two discoveries. Mm -hmm. How should we convince the society that we should it's worth to invest in, in this field and not for instance in treating cancer, right. which is a more real uh, problem. Yeah, so there, I think there are two parts to that to answering that question. One is the which is not enough on its own, but it's true, is that for every pound or every euro you spend on, on particle physics you get more euros back again. There are many studies that show that. So it's not a net cost in that sense, okay? And, and there, there, are, there are studies that show the technological um, spin-out of this, the, the fact that a lot, most of the money is spent in high-ticket industry anyway, so it doesn't vanish. Um, and in particular, actually, in the UK, there's a big awareness of the training. But what I said about physics being exciting, it's not because necessarily we want more particle physicists, but they do want more people doing STEM subjects at school and, and university, and that is, we've seen a turnaround in the number of people doing physics and engineering. And 
there was, there's a study, there's a thing in the UK called the REF, which you may, may have heard of, I hope you haven't, but it's, it's a research excellence framework where they assess, assess the, the impact of various um, areas of research, not just in academic terms, but in economic and sociological terms. And particle physics came out of that very well, and it wasn't being evaluated by academics, it was being evaluated by industrialists and business people as well, mostly them. And they said, well, we don't care about the technologies and the patents and, and the licensing, the, and the, the web, or the flat screen, and all the things that you wheel out to justify the spin-offs. And we actually care about the people you're training. And, and they, they are absolutely essential for our industry. And if you're not doing exciting physics, they won't do physics. So that, that's one of them. Is that, that it's not a cost, it's an investment. The, the more subtle thing, you, you can then ask after that, yeah, but is this the best, if you're good, okay, so investing in scientific research is a good idea. <coughs> is this the best scientific research to invest in? What's the opportunity cost of building a big collider? What could you have done instead? Even given that, you know, it's not a net cost, are there other areas of science that you, you know, that's a, at some level that's a scientific argument, because if we lose the excitement, if we build a boring machine, that, that, <laughs> we're, that we're not excited with ourselves, then we won't get them. The, the, the excited scientists coming into it, right? and that's the harder challenge. I think we have. To, this is why we have heated discussions in Granada because we have to have a, we have to be excited ourselves by the program. And some level, the cost then is a secondary thing because we know we'll get the money back if it's an exciting program. But if it's not an exciting program, if there's other more exciting science done with the same money, that's where we have to have the discussion. As a particle physicist, I think it's really exciting, and I would like to carry on with it. But I, I not, but that's you know that's my opinion, and that's the discussion. I think we have to focus on rather than rather than why should you get five billion of public money? Because the simple answer is because you'll get ten billion back. But the but the question is, well, why should you get five billion and not someone else? Now, I wouldn't take cancer research as an option because cancer research is applied, and it benefits hugely from what we're doing anyway. But maybe building LISA and, and looking for gravitational waves, or I don't know, I'm not going to invent other people's good science <laughs> projects for them, but maybe there's a finite number of these big projects you can do, and maybe um, particle physics isn't the right one. And that's the discussion we have to have, I think. Um, I believe it is, but no, we'll, we'll see. One or four questions. I was excited to see you explain Z plus Z cross sections. I hope that can excite yeah. well, people. Because people do tend to summarize the field as discover the H and discover Z and that's it. But there is a lot more and you can get that across. Good. Thank you. I think we have to move in that direction ourselves because I think honestly that is that is gen a genuine reflection of the motivation of many people in the field, but I think you're right, it doesn't come across. Thank you very much. Thank you.